Hi, everyone. Welcome to MJH Live, the online public program series of New York's Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. My name is Samantha Shokin, manager of public programs. And today we are joined by clinical psychologist, Dr. Irit Felsen and best-selling author Elizabeth Rosner for a discussion of how trauma is passed down and expressed by children of Holocaust survivors, or what we sometimes refer to as two Gs. Elizabeth Rosner is a best-selling novelist, poet, and essayist. Her 2017 book, Survivor Cafe, The Legacy of Trauma and the Labyrinth of Memory, focuses not only on direct descendants of the Holocaust, but also our collective responsibility to understand and prevent genocide. Survivor Cafe was featured on NPR's All Things Considered and in the New York Times, and was also a finalist for the National Jewish Book Award. Blending memoir and research, her three acclaimed novels have been translated into nine languages and received prizes in the, in the United States and Europe. Elizabeth lectures and teaches inter internationally, and today is joining us from upstate New York. So welcome, Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. Hello. Uh, and Dr. Irit Felsen is a clinical psychologist specializing in trauma and traumatic loss with a special focus on Holocaust survivors and their families. Irit is a researcher with the Yale University Trauma Study Group. Her research on the effects of trauma and intergenerational transmission of trauma have been published in a variety of scientific journals, in book chapters in the International Handbook of Multi-Generational Legacies of Trauma, and the recently published book, Psychoanalysis and Holocaust Testimonies, Unwanted Memories. Irit served as the clinical coordinator for, of services for Holocaust survivors at the Jewish Family Services of Metro West in New Jersey, and as a New Jersey State Emergency Psychiatric Services screener. So welcome, Irit. Hello. Hi. Nice to be here, Samantha. It's Hi, nice Elizabeth. to have you. <laughs> uh, technical difficulties aside, it's, it's great to hear and see you both. Um, before we get star started, I'd like to remind all of our viewers watching that today's program is being recorded and will be uploaded to the museum's YouTube channel in the coming days. I'll be sure to send out a link uh, to that video in my follow-up email. And finally, we will have time for a Q&A at the conclusion of the program. Uh, to participate, please submit your comments and questions into the chat box, as many of you have already been doing. So that is it from me. I'll be behind the scenes um, manning the, the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, so without further ado, please welcome Elizabeth Rosner and Irit Felsen. Thanks so much, Samantha. I, I want to say, um, that it's it's really an honor and a privilege to be able to have this conversation online with Irit and also to include as many of your questions by the end as as we possibly can get to it's it's so valuable to have the opportunity to speak internationally this way on subjects that that we all care about so deeply and that are so truly complex and um, Irit and I have have been thinking a lot about all the different ways to approach this conversation and one of the things that some of you may have heard anecdotally and for me it's it's an anecdote i've been familiar with for decades now which is that among the descendants of holocaust survivors we find ourselves uh greatly represented maybe even overrepresented in two major areas in the field of psychotherapy and in the creative arts and so that is in some ways the foundation for our discussion here today is how those two maybe divergent and maybe deeply intersecting and interconnected ways of coping with our inheritance show up in the world in us individually and in us collectively. So um, I'm going to see if Irit wants to jump in right now too. So uh, it is a pleasure and an honor to do this together with you, Elizabeth, and thank you, Samantha, for organizing this. Um, I think that your book is really an amazingly uh, interesting, well-written, uh, fabulous book, and I am not an easy critic, as I'm sure you are. We read a lot of Holocaust literature and literature related to it. And uh, I really think that this book is one that um, that I would warmly recommend, mm -hmm. and it stands it stands out, and it really um, 
includes in it in a very, uh, while the topic is of course very complicated and very heavy, it's a very easy read mm -hmm. and it really includes very beautifully both your very personal perspective and uh, uh, a nice way of weaving in some very important research about the second generation as well as other trauma exposed populations and the impact that we see there. Many of those uh, processes are very similar. So uh, I thought that it would be um, very interesting to talk a little bit about our personal journey into our different ways of uh, uh, doing what we're doing because each of us essentially at least I can definitely say for me, uh, my career has focused greatly on survivors and their families. And uh, I believe that that is also true a lot about your uh, creative career. It's not just this book, uh, right? Although this is the most biographical, autobiographical one. Well, yeah, like you, I think I found my way to this material um, with a kind of inevitability that even though I always wanted to be a writer and I always wanted to express myself creatively um, through the arts and the visual arts and the dramatic arts, and I was a dancer and a musician, um, writing really gave me the opportunity to delve into what I felt was given to me as my material, it, you know, all the way into my psyche, my bones, my organs, <laughs> my body, and my heart. And so even though I began publishing as a novelist and a poet, um, my autobiographical material was always woven into my characters' lives, into the stories I was telling, into the questions I was asking, and it was with this most recent book of nonfiction, for the first time really writing directly in nonfiction, I was, I was being more um, straightforward, I guess you could say, about telling my own story as a daughter of two survivors and particularly focusing on a sequence of journeys that I took to Germany with my father over a period of many decades. And, and then, as you mentioned, finding my way into a vast, vast array of research onto not exactly comparable, because I avoid that word comparative. I, I really avoid the notion of whether we're comparing the Holocaust to anything else, but to talk about what other genocides, what other atrocities, what other collective legacies of trauma look like and feel like to populations throughout the world and, and over centuries really of history. So as you say, I was trying to be deeply faithful to my personal legacy, but I was also trying to connect the dots and, and create a kind of web of, of unified field really. And somebody already raised um, the word epigenetics in the chat, I noticed, and, and we'll probably talk about that at some point. But it was really this discovery of um, the somewhat new science now of measuring the impact of trauma on our DNA, on the modification and expression of our DNA, that really led me to consider my work not just as a creative writer, but also as an investigator in a way, and someone curious about what are all the different ways of understanding what we carry and how we express that. So I think that there are so many things in what you just said that I, that I would like to uh, tap into in terms of my journey. Uh, first of all, you know, one aspect that I didn't expect to find in our stories, you know, I expected to have a lot of points of contact, but um, the Hamburg connection was a very unusual one, not necessarily expected, uh, because as a um, young woman, I went to Hamburg as a representative of the Israeli government. I worked for the Israeli government in Hamburg for four and a half years, and that's where I did my PhD, and it was the most fascinating uh, kind of personal journey that took place there. And in fact, in my kitchen, I have a show and tell. Mm -hmm. In my kitchen, I have this picture 
uh -huh. of wow. Hamburg because that's also where I met my husband. Mm. And so it's a, it was a very special period in my life, which allowed me a lot of experiences that were really, uh, for example, the, um, the plumber who came to fix something in my apartment who spoke from a hole in his, um, you know, um, neck because of an old injury and said to me in this very, very raspy voice that came out of here, it was the beginning of the time of riots in Hamburg against the Auslanders, against the Turkish population. And he said to me, Junge Frau, what Germany needs now is a dictator. That's what would make everything right again. And he says that to me, knowing that I am from Israel. However, I wanted to go back. There were many fascinating anecdotes. And as I was reading your book, Elizabeth, I was thinking I should at least put it on paper for the benefit of my own family, <laughs> if not for mm -hmm. other people. Uh, but in terms of the faithfulness to our own materials, unlike you, my very, very beginning was uh, a little bit less um, confident it was my master's dissertation for the, the degree in clinical psychology. In Israel, we do a master's and we write a dissertation, which is like the doctoral dissertation that people write here. And initially, I did not quite allow myself to say that I want to study the intergenerational phenomena in families of Holocaust survivors. It took me a while. And... Um, and the, the impetus was definitely, it was definitely what was most of interest to me. And the dedication of my master's thesis read, uh, it's, a, it's a verse from Genesis that is very beautiful in Hebrew. And I'm not sure I can translate it quite as well in English. But it says on the sixth, uh, in the fourth verse of the sixth chapter of Genesis, it says, and the giant walked upon the earth at that time and thereafter. Mm -hmm. And it was with my parents in mind that I put that verse as the dedication because I was so interested in what happened to them, what happened to all those friends of theirs that I grew up with, and how did they manage to stay so positive and so productive and so loving. But it took me a while to actually have the courage to say, this is what I want to do, and this is what I did. And it really put me on a path of something that I'm extremely passionate about since then. But some of the reasons why I went, unlike you, into the research part were and the research and the clinical work. So the choice of the topic, I think nobody who doesn't have a very profound and deep love and sense of obligation to our personal uh, background would choose to dedicate their career to these issues, which are very, very um, difficult in many ways. But my choice of going into that uh, route was much influenced by the fact that my parents were very private people. They were very open as, as, as hosts. There, our house was very open. People could always come and congregate there. There was very good food, and always people could stay to sleep over. But my parents did not speak about their Holocaust experiences to people outside the very close and intimate circle of the family and the close friends that were also survivors. They were very private, and I said it was their story. And, um, and also, it was a time in Israel when second generation did not identify as second generation. We were sabras. We were not second generation. And we were not related to the diaspora. And also, it was a time in general in psychology and in, in science, in social sciences in particular, where the personal situatedness of the researcher was very much frowned upon. We did not speak about the topic as our topic, any topic. You had to be an objective researcher that looks at a topic or at a subject matter from a distance. 
you didn't speak of it as, well, this is my thing and I'm looking at it because it's very interesting to me. It was really still before the new emphasis on the fact that we all look at any topic from our own person, personal perspective and uh, none of us is objective and the acknowledgement of our personal contextualized relationship to the topic is relatively new. But at the time, it would mean that I was not professional enough, too emotional, mm -hmm. didn't have enough of a distance from the topic. So I went into research and into clinical work because it seems to me that only those of us who have a little bit of that fire, that were touched by that fire, can stand in those very difficult places with survivors and with some of us second generation, sometimes places where the closest family members are excluded from, but the clinical psychologist is allowed in. Can I jump in for a second? I, you know, I think you touched on so many, um, so many interesting ideas that are really relevant, not just to you and me, but I suspect to a lot of our generation. And, and that is that kind of, um, spectrum, let's say, of behaviors in our parents, either the ones who never spoke or the ones who spoke all the time, the ones who were very, very private and almost secretive about their history, and the ones who were, let's say, proud or very forthcoming. And then, then you also touched on that same kind of polarization in professional lives, that either you had to really distance yourself from this subject in order to prove that you were you were objective and um, and that you were you know, yeah that you were true to your field you were true to your subject and not biased in some way and then there's been this shift I think in in more recent years toward a recognition that that there isn't really no such thing as objectivity or that ob objectivity is kind of ever elusive and that what we really can offer is the strength of our of our personal passion as you mentioned and and that what we bring to our material can actually benefit the depth and the breadth that we that we address it with and that you know to not see those things as dichotomous or either or that that you can be personally involved in the subject and still bring a lot of professionalism to it and that I think, you know, in the same way that I don't like to see creativity and research as distinct and, and cut off from one another, that my own, my own path was really to weave them together. And I think also in your research, you have, you have incorporated, you know, creative modalities and an interest in the arts. And so we don't see them as, as divided at all. Not at all. And in fact, uh, in my own research, um, as well as, um, uh, let's say, in my own research, I also include very much a shift towards uh, testimonies and, and really maintaining the voice of the uh, interviewees, you know, as it is in their own voice, in mm -hmm. their own words, because, uh, because what we also have come to recognize, and, and many of us feel this way, is that when you when you work with extreme trauma with the extremes of human experience the words that we use for writing a scientific document can actually totally distort the very phenomena that we try to study because mm -hmm. they sanitize it and they make it into something very different from what it is so where is the word of the testimony itself or the word of a literature or a creative writing uh, or more, are more, more faithful in that way to the actual uh, way that people speak and express trauma. Mm -hmm. So there is a real issue of translating it and perhaps distorting it when you do scientific statistical studies. On the other hand, so I, we did go into, you know, my late very good friend, Dori Lau, who was a child survivor, uh, psychiatrist at Yale, and his wife, the late uh, Johanna uh, Bodenstab, um, we did work with the testimonies themselves, trying to incorporate the very words 
of the people into the uh, written material. And, uh, you know, like uh, Svetlana Alex Alexievich, the uh, Nobel Prize winner who wrote about women in the Soviet Union during World War II, it's not even just the words. Sometimes it's the cadence. It's actually the silences that come at the worst part of the worst experiences. And we have to find another way of capturing that, which statistical and quantitative studies don't do very well. But one of the reasons why I love also the quantitative statistical large samples is because they allow us generalizability, what we call. They allow us to refute the claim that, oh, but this is not because of the Holocaust. It's because this person was sick before. It's because this and that. It's not really because of the, uh, of the Holocaust. Or um, it's just, you know, and, and there are some very serious researchers who claim that. I often quote from a letter that Robert Krell, a psychiatrist and child survivor, has in one of his papers where one of the West German psychiatrists assessing a 19-year-old boy for reparations wrote, you know, he was 19 years old when he left the concentration camps. He was there for four years. It's not possible that his experiences at such an age are related to his anxiety and to other symptoms. Uh, there is a very famous psychiatrist who wrote in 1970, there are no uh, psychiatric impacts uh, in Vietnam vets that are coming back. So studies on large samples are very important to show the validity of a phenomenon, and it's very important for me to show the validity of the phenomena. I, I completely agree with what you're saying, and I think it's, it's just another example of to say both and, right? That the the yeah. uniqueness of an individual experience can be looked at exactly alongside a large echoing repetition of behaviors and patterns and that it isn't one or the other and and neither is adequate really and and what you said about silences i think is incredibly important that sometimes as much information is gathered from what can't be expressed as what is being expressed. And one of the reasons I included in my book um, references to what's happening currently with Black Lives Matter, it was, it, it was a way of saying all of these movements of saying the names of people who have been murdered by police or saying the names of an individual who was lynched in the Jim Crow South, all of these efforts, these very deliberate, determined efforts to single out the individual death, the individual victim, as a way of saying, this is what you need to understand. These events happened to one person at a time, one family at a time, one community at a time, and the collective impact then reverberates in a way that is both ginormous, you know, really, monumentally huge and epic, but also singular in the way that an individual reader or listener or empathetic observer can relate to. And that also connects us to our present moment. So that's another thing that I really feel is important for us to keep talking about is that often those of us who are especially interested in in considering the, the Holocaust and its effects, we aren't looking backwards. We aren't always, you know, immersed in the past. And the Holocaust survivor that I quote, that I will always, always cite as my, um, my iconic person, and I don't even know who said it first, but said, I don't live in the past, the past lives in me. And this, this accusation or this, critique that we are spending too much time in history rather than in the present is simply false. And again, I refuse to accept that there's a dichotomy there, that we have to choose, are we looking backwards or are we looking forwards? I think, I think we can only look forward by accepting and acknowledging the way the past is inside of us, the way the past affects us now and continues to affect us. And that doesn't mean, and I really want to emphasize this, and I know you also do this in your work, Irit, because so much of your work is about healing and transformation, 
that the naming of these things isn't to say we are doomed to carry this forever, isn't to say that we are perpetual victims and we will never be free of the, of the victimization or the sorrow or the grieving, but to say that this is what makes us who we are and enables us to emphasize our resilient nature, our tenacious nature, our optimistic nature, our creative nature, and that all of those things blend and harmonize. And that, you know, I wrote a line for one of my characters in my first novel that I wrote, you know, 25 years ago, it was published 20 years ago now, um, that if I had the choice, to carry my father's story or not, would I still choose? Would I say yes? And my answer is always yes, still. Not because it's a burden, but because it has shaped who I am. It has made me more empathetic, more compassionate, more willing to um, connect with others and to, and to want to know someone else's story and someone else's pain so that I don't see myself as separate from them or special in some way, but that we all carry something and, and we are all shaped by what we've inherited. Absolutely. And uh, I'll just add another, um, another aspect to it, which is, as you say, of course, as a clinical psychologist and as a psychologist researcher, for me, the, uh, the main uh, emphasis is on healing. It's not on historiography, it's on healing. Mm -hmm. And we can't really heal unless we also understand the way in which all kinds of messages have sunk into our fibers and into our uh, non-conscious uh, way of being in the world. And they sank in there in many, many ways, uh, many implicit, but many also uh, ma many explicit and many also implicit. And I actually, Samantha, could you go to my um, to my PowerPoint for a minute, if you don't mind? Absolutely. Just a moment. Let me pull it up. While she's doing that, I wanted to mention something about epigenetics and the way that sometimes the debate about epigenetics, I think, gets tangled up in how much proof we have. And uh, maybe we can come back to that. But I think it's less a question of proving things and more a question of addressing them and working with them. So I'll let you go back to your slide now. So uh, Samantha, if you could go to the first one, uh, that's the only photograph that I have of my father's family and my uh, mother's family, there isn't a single photograph left, which was one of the most painful uh, losses for my mother, um, and I uh, have no idea, therefore, of how those people looked. And I think, Elizabeth, you mentioned something very poignant somewhere in your book about the uh, physical resemblance um, and photographs. I think it was a, a comment that you made about, about how important it is to be able to see that and, uh, and I think that was, uh, it reminded me of a, of a comment by Marianne Hirsch, who said that photographs are the vehicle through which family memory is uh, perpetuated and moved forward. And we don't have that. So it is so important to, to have the only thing that we have. We don't have heirlooms. You know, when I moved to Hamburg and I rented uh, my apartment from this lady, who lived uh, in the uh, bottom part of the house. She had what's called in German a vitrine, you know, a glass, beautiful glass um, cabinet with all kinds of items in there that came down the generation from her great, great grandfather who did business with the Russian Tsar. And I remember the poignant sense of envy that I had that they have it and we have nothing that lived with our with our family, with our ancestors, because our objects are strewn somewhere in various homes in Poland and in, uh, and in uh, wherever else uh, people took them. But, um, but I did want to show you, uh, perhaps I'll skip over Samantha to the uh, uh, slide with the, with the picture from Mouse, which is uh, three, four slides down. Right. 
So when I said about how things implicitly and explicitly come into us, this is something that I often use in lectures. It's just one example of many. It's a page from Mouse where a little mouse comes home crying and his father asks him, why are you crying? And he says, I was playing with my friends and I fell and they ran away and they didn't wait for me. And daddy offhandedly just responds, friends? You know, put them in a room for a week without food, and then you'll see what friends are. And that's an explicit way of transmitting, you know, the mistrust, the sense that the world is dangerous, the sense that our reality is not necessarily the reality uh, of life, the reality that lies underneath in what I call, you know, the dual reality of children of survivors. And these messages that sometimes are actually explicit like that and sometimes are uh, in a look or a turn of the head or a, a silence, uh, those are things that sink in as part of the way we then feel in the world and respond to things in our reality, responding from that backdrop of the reality of trauma that was communicated in these ways. And if we don't know the phenomenon, if we don't understand what was transmitted, how it was transmitted, then we take it to be the reality. It is how we feel. It is how we react. And that may very well interfere in many ways with our lives and ways of being in the world in our own time and in our own context. So for me, it's very important to understand what it is because of the way that it impacts how we are, how we be now. I love, um, I love the reference to Art Spiegelman's book, Mouse, because it was really a, a kind of a breakthrough publication for our generation in the way that um, Helen Epstein's book, Children of the Holocaust, really named things for the generation of, of descendants of survivors who were born in Europe in DP camps right at the end of the war. And I was born on the last day of the 60s, so I was born in the United States. I felt a lot more removed from that European landscape or that immediate post-war landscape. But I think um, Art Spiegelman tried to talk about, um, well, he, he brought this unique format for one thing and he was also a perfect example of using a personal story to illuminate a broader generational narrative and um and i think what we find is that that resonance we recognize when we hear someone like daniel mendelson who did the same thing with his story of a search for his book the lost a search for six of six million even though he himself is not a direct son of survivors he would walk into a room of, of relatives who would burst into tears seeing him because he looked exactly like the murdered uncle and that, um, that Daniel never even knew. And so I think this, this way that, that the stories are being given to us directly, indirectly, the things we recognize in one another's stories, the things that we feel aren't representative of us exactly, but that come close somehow to addressing what we carry. This feeling that um, epigenetics brought to me was the idea that having been told, for example, I was being too sensitive, that I was carrying more than I needed to carry, that nothing bad ever happened to me directly. Why would I be nervous? Why would I be hypervigilant? Why would I be anxious? the scientific studies were a way of saying you are not imagining this, that whether or not your parents meant to do this, that no one, no one chose to pass on trauma and PTSD to their offspring. They would have chosen the opposite had they been able to choose, but that this was given to us without our permission, without their permission. It's something right. that, that happens both physiologically and psychologically and, and maybe even spiritually. And that's why I was saying before this question of, do we get to prove definitively that the DNA is modified by trauma and how many generations does that modification last? And all of those questions that sometimes people get very anxious about or determined to unlock, 
I think that might be a distraction from the core material, which is we feel it to be true. We recognize it to be true, that my generation understood we were carrying things that didn't technically belong to us. We, we were carrying the suitcases of our parents' exile, you know, in ways that um, we couldn't prove it. But to validate it, as you say, both at the individual level and the collective level, gives us a sense that now we can move forward and say, okay, if that's true, how can I work with that? How can I lighten that load? How can I put those bags down for a while? How can I not pass it on to the next generation and the next? And I think that's where, ironically, the two Gs, you know, I think that that number, that letter number, 2G, actually emerged for me and my awareness when the three Gs came along. That it was the 3G, the third generation, who started calling themselves 3G, and then that cast back on us the 2G identification. And so I think that already represented metaphorically in a way, you know, we're trying to abbreviate it, we're trying to shorten it, we're trying to diminish its power over who we are, but we can have a lot of curiosity about it. We can be intrigued by it, we can ask a lot of questions. And so these generalizations, um, you know, they're helpful to us in terms of giving us models, we're giving us frameworks and then individually, therapeutically, creatively, artistically, you know, through film, through visual art, through drama, through all kinds of therapy modalities, not just the talk therapies, but a lot of trauma is addressed now with EMDR and, and somatic experiencing. There are just a wealth of options for addressing trauma as an embodied experience, right? Um, and I'm wondering if, um, I'm, I'm not sure, Samantha, how we're doing with time, but I, I know we also I want to I want think to we have five more minutes to a quarter two. Am I what? right, Samantha? That's correct. Okay. So yeah. um, I didn't want to just try and, uh, you know, shorten what we were saying, but I think these, these I'm, I'm keeping half an eye on the chat as well to notice you know, what are people especially wanting to hear from us before we wrap up our, our portion and, and turn to the Q&A. So I think that, um, you know, I have books you can read if you want to know more of my personal story, but um, Irit, did we lose your audio for a second? Can't hear you. Mm -mm. Irit, um, huh. Let's see. So Samantha, while Irid is working out her audio, um, are you compiling the questions over there? And yes, um, I've compiled okay. a few, so we can get started on the Q and A, and hopefully Irid will be able to um, connect back with her audio. Yeah. What do we do? Um, so let's see here. We have we have a bunch. Um, how about this question? Um, from Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca is a Jewish woman in her mid-20s who's getting a master's in literature with a focus on drama studies. And her research is interested in how third generation survivors um, experiences in literature and film and television are different um, oh, from, from first and second generation literature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, she's wondering if Elizabeth, you could speak to that in any way. Have you noticed that those of those of us with more distance from the Shoah tell the narrative of the show in different ways. Hi. Generations. Oh, you hear me again? Great. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. The problem yeah. with the phone is that uh, apparently when there is a phone call that's coming in, it disconnects the audio. That makes sense. So um, yeah. let, me, let me just repeat the question, um, uh, Irid, that we have from a viewer. Uh, I just said one thing before before uh, we go to that. I just wanted to end uh, uh, with uh, with a point to add to uh, to what Elizabeth said. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, it, it is important to mention that there is, a, of course, an enormous variability among us all as two Gs. People, uh, each of us has had uh, a different experience. Our parents had different experiences. They healed to different degrees after the war. And it's important to recognize also the variability in the group. Um, it's just an important point that I want to throw in there uh, yeah. before we 
before we leave off. That's a great segue, actually, to my response to the question that Samantha was just citing from um, this woman. Is it Rebecca? Is that her name? Yep. Um, because I, you know, again, these generalizations they they don't always apply. But I think that what I've experienced and what I've heard from a lot of two G um, artists and writers is that. A lot of times we were deeply immersed in feeling some of the suppressed and lost feelings that our parents didn't get to. They couldn't afford, let's say. They couldn't, they didn't have the emotional or, or psychological bandwidth to tolerate their own grief and mourning and that a lot of our experience was given over to processing their feelings as well as our own, including sometimes bitterness, resentment, anger, frustration that we you know, weren't really given our own space to feel and have our lives. Whereas that distance that's increased for the 3G does give them more spaciousness to hold the story with more curiosity, a little more generosity sometimes. And yet that creativity also returns them to digging more deeply into the story itself you know, not just the feelings of the events, but, but what happened and can you fill in that, that dot and, and can I retrace the journey? I'm thinking, for example, of Rachel Cerati, who did this incredible podcast called We Share the Same Sky that I recommend to everybody as a granddaughter of a survivor. She's 3G and she did this beautiful, long, years long journey of retracing her grandmother's teenage experiences and visiting the places where her grandmother was hidden and the people who saved her. And I think that's a beautiful portrait of what that granddaughter could do that in a way a daughter could not. And there are other films that I could reference as well. But, but I do think there, there are really fascinating distinctions between the 2G and 3G um, there, literary there are creative response. Yeah. There definitely are. Uh, very significant differences. I think that here it's important to mention, again, to connect to the point that I made about our variability. I think that uh, what studies show us now very clearly is that one of the most important um, influencing uh, factors in, in terms of what kind of an impact did the parents' history have on their children one of the most impactful uh, pa uh, factor is the level to which, as I kind of said before, the level to which the parents still continued to uh, suffer from what we now call post-traumatic stress disorder, symptoms that include depression and anxiety and uh, fatigue and dissociation and rageful expo explosions and aggression within the family, which was very little talked about until only something like 10, 10 years ago uh, at most. So when parents continue to suffer from these symptoms more severely, the outcomes in the children were more uh, 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 problematic, more impactful. And uh, in that sense, the second generation not only sort of contained or held uh, feelings that the parents couldn't allow themselves to, to feel, it also had a very direct um, relationship with the parents in which those post-traumatic symptoms were very hurtful, very frightening, very scary, and created a sense of what my friend in Haifa, Hadass Weissman, uh, a, a great researcher, called a failed sense of intersubjectivity, the feeling that the parents were not safe or the feeling that the parents were not emotionally available, even when they tried to be very uh, protective of the child and, and provide for physical needs. So that was something that was very much part in the actual day-to-day uh, -day emotional family life relationship with the parents that impacted the second generation. For the third generation, the grandparents are often very different. More time has gone by. Uh, they heal better. They have a different relationship. There is a generation in between that protects the, the third generation. And there is a very different uh, 
um, level of symptomatology in the uh, survivors as they age often. However, um, I think that, that these, these things are very important. And there is also another point, by the way, Elizabeth, your brother Raphael and my brother Raphael are uh, male children of survivors. And that's another point that I wanted to throw in there, that gender is a very important uh, mm. part also in making uh, the interactions between fathers and sons, fathers and daughters, mothers and sons, mothers and daughters in Holocaust families uh, very different many times in many ways in terms of which part of the feeling, which part of the story, which part of the resilience, which part of the victimized uh, experiences, each of us carries more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. So much, so much we can cover. And I know, I know our time is short. So what other questions are you finding, Samantha? Um, we're getting a lot of questions here about epigenetics. Uh, this one comes from Judith. Judith uh, asks, given how profound the impact of experience and, uh, quote, post memories uh, can be, what does the possibility of a scientific trace of trauma on top of the gene mean to you? Yeah, so I, um, I really felt, as I said, that when I first encountered the studies um, of mice, that was where the epigenetics first connected the dots for me and that... Um, Dr. Um, Rachel Yehuda in Israel started to connect the epigenetic yeah. studies with the Holocaust survivor families. There was this tremendous feeling of relief to me, ironically, that that I, as I said before, I wasn't imagining my my own traumatic residue, and and that there was a name for it, and there was a way of acknowledging it that was. Um, we talked before about objectivity, that it was objectively validated by someone other than, you know, someone knowing me personally or, or recognizing something about me personally. And then I think there was that second wave of, oh no, you know, does that mean I am, I am marked in some way? I'm damaged. And, you know, I carry the genetic mutation from my mother that, um, that, made me prone to having breast cancer. I've actually had breast cancer twice now. And, and this idea that, you know, that's a marker that you don't want to carry. That's a genetic modification you don't want to inherit. And, and so what do I do with this additional now genetic uh, disadvantage? But I think what it instead leads me to believe is that, um, that now we can study the idea of healing, as we've talked about, that Dr. Yehuda emphasizes that if we can be biologically modified by trauma, we can biologically change again. That this isn't a singular change that can never be reversed or never re-modified. And so that gives me a lot of hope and, and faith that this is a movement in, a, in another direction that we can take as well. And so epigenetic studies are there to provide us with a pathway forward. And, and no, I wanted to say, um, if you have anything to add, please do. Uh, otherwise, I'll, I'll take the next question. I think maybe we should take the next question then. Sure. Um, next question comes from Philip. Uh, Philip wants to know if there are any generalizations we can make about survivors and descendants who are able to live more positive, forward-looking forward lives versus those who live with and pass down their unresolved anger, bitterness, anxiety, et cetera. Uh, what makes some people able to process and move on and others not? So, um, you know, we, this is something that I think is extremely important and that was for me very important from the beginning, the focus on the resilience of uh, the survivors that I knew and what made it possible for them. And as I uh, delved into the, uh, the field as a researcher, it's pretty uh, complicated. There are many, many, many uh, parameters that were looked at and, you know, uh, resilience can only be something that we infer 
in people who have had very difficult experiences, right? Nobody can be considered resilient unless they had some very difficult experiences. So we look at people who went through very difficult experiences, and we try to compare those that seem to have done better and those who seem to have done less well, and try to see what differentiates between them. That's really the question that this person asks uh, right now. So in the beginning, we thought that resilience is just something that people have or don't have. It's, a, it's like you are or you're not resilient. And then it became a much more nuanced question of uh, certain ways of coping that are more resilient. Some people learn and have more adaptive ways of coping with the situation. And then we thought that being resilient means coming out of a bad situation with no symptoms. But we now recognize that we actually can have symptoms that are related to our traumatic experiences and at the same time have a lot of resilience. So it's a very complex uh, uh, concept. And, uh, and I do want to emphasize that, that people can actually have uh, symptoms of post-traumatic reaction and a lot of resilience. And in fact, they are actually positively correlated. It seems mm-hmm. like the more you suffer, the more you actually uh, draw on your resilience and try to even make sense of it in what we call post-traumatic growth. But in the end, with all of the factors that we try to examine that contributes to the people who manage to remain resilient and to, and to live after the trauma a better life, we come to the fact that a lot of things are uh, interrelated so it's all kinds of complicated interaction. And I have to, to emphasize one of the most important things are the conditions with which a person is met after the trauma. That seems to be extremely important in how well people can do afterwards. Even though it's amazing, many survivors met with very little support, family support or systemic support. But in the end, all of these factors Uh, are in very complicated interactions with each other, and there's only one factor that relatively alone has a very, very high weight, and that is a very strong, positive, early attachment relationship. Mm. That is very important for us to remember in terms of, you know, our families, and in terms of our society, and now all of these families with children of refugees and children who suffer enormous uh, trauma, it's that which determines what kind of adults they will be, how resilient they will be, and what kind of family members and, and citizens they will be. So we are very invested, actually, in trying to make that those attachment relationships and those early years better for these families, for these parents who have been traumatized and for their children. I do. I write a little bit about that in Survivor Cafe as well, the studies about um, attachment theory and, and showing that that is a way to transform the epigenetic inheritance of trauma is to teach teach a parent how to attach when they themselves didn't appear, didn't experience strong attachment with their own parent. And that that's the way you break a cycle and that's the way you, you reform and, and transform. Yeah. And by the way, I'd like to mention, uh, I was involved and still am uh, with a group of widows of uh, September 11th who were pregnant when their husbands were killed. And there is a beautiful picture book by Beatrice Beebe, a researcher at Columbia University, that shows the micro interaction between mothers and infants and how we manage to intervene with these mothers at a very early age to change the transmission of trauma Mm -hmm. with these babies that were born when their mothers were so traumatized. Mm -hmm. Mm Uh, so that's, we've just about run out of time. Mm. Um, but if, if you guys want, we can take just one more question since we started late. Yeah, we started a little late. So let's do one more. 
Great. Um, so this question comes from our viewer Simon, and he wants us to, or wants you uh, to address the creativity aspect of this um, this program. Uh, he he wants to know if creating art, music, etc., is a means of expressing, counteracting, or working out residual effects of trauma. And Jamie also wants to. Uh, ask a similar question related to creativity. If there are any trends that you notice in creative output for people whose parents did or did not talk about their experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a wonderfully complicated question and, and deserves a complicated answer. I think that, again, across a spectrum of responses, there are people who do greatly representational art as a way of bringing image back into their visual field. I think that relates to what Irit was talking about when, when your family lacks photographs, when you don't know who you resemble, when you, when you don't have faces and images, um, there's, there's this urgency or this longing to, um, to reinvent image and to recreate and refabricate the, the people that were erased or vanished or disappeared from your history and your ancestry. And then in the other direction are people who can only create abstract work because they feel incapable of, um, of working with the immediacy of image and that that has a significance in the sense of all that erasure producing only indirect imagery and that there is no way to reproduce the faces that were lost. There's no way to recreate the images that were lost. And then everything in between, I think, you know, someone also was asking about, you know, the so-called negative responses to um, ancestral dynamics or family dynamics where there was a lot of rage in the family or a lot of hostility or a lot of blaming a lot of um, fear driven parenting styles. And so some of the artistic responses were about processing feelings that weren't allowed in the family. People who needed to find an outlet for their own feelings, as I said, when they felt their own feelings were denied expression in the family. And so there's the literature of, there's, there's Holocaust humor, there's Holocaust anger, there's, you know, and, and someone also I wanted to address the question of using the word 2D survivor. I myself am very uncomfortable referencing myself as a survivor. So my creative response was to really break down word by word language and how I felt a sense of connection or disconnection from certain words or certain um, phrases. And um, I could go on and on about that. It's why I write books. I, I have a lot to say about these subjects. So you read, I'll, I'll let you answer. I, I just wanted to add uh, that there are two beautiful books that I believe are available in English. One is by Batia Brutin, who, uh, who curated a very beautiful exhibition of art by second generation and wrote the book which I believe is based on her um, dissertation about art, visual art by second generation. And the other is uh, a book by Iris Milner about literature by the second generation. And I think uh, for the person who asked this question, these might be very interesting resources. Fantastic. Um, so that's all the time we actually have for. I'm going to have to close this out, although there are so, so many interesting comments and questions coming in. Um, don't worry, I will include links. Yeah, Yuri, do you want to say something? I just had a thought because there are so, if there are so many questions, perhaps you can send us the questions and maybe we can do something in writing online some kind of a dialogue where we answer some of these questions or something like that. It's just a thought. Yeah, uh, so I was going to suggest um, including links to both of your websites, uh, which have contact information there in my follow-up email and also links to your pu various publications. Um, and of course, everyone has, you know, my, my email address and, um, you know, contact information of the museum. So if any questions come in my way, I'll forward them to you. So we'll have some, some sort of uh, communication uh, exchange. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to thank, thank you both for this really 
tremendously fascinating uh, conversation. I, I, it could really go on, um, Elizabeth, as you said, that's why, that's why you write books and why both of you are in this field. You have a lot to say, and it is so interesting. Um, I, will, I will follow up tomorrow to all of today's registrants with a link to this conversation, which was recorded. All of the museum public programs um, are recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel. So I'll be sure to send out a link to that, uh, in addition to links to both of Elizabeth and their eReads websites and their, their various books. Um, so I want to thank all of our participants to, uh, for, for tuning in today. Uh, once again, I, I wish we had time uh, to continue the conversation, but, but maybe in the future we can, we can you know, do, do this again. We'll do a two hour one next time. <laughs> Thank you, Samantha. Thank you, Irit. Thank you, everyone, for coming from far and wide and, and listening and, and participating. And I, I, I welcome all the, all the after, afterward dialogue as well. So thank you. It's a privilege. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Samantha. It was really a very, very uh, valuable conversation, I think. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. All right. Take care. Bye.